Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, very unique and special program that we host on the Soil Digital Channel. I'm particularly pleased that this evening we have Laura Kohler with us. I first met Laura many years back when the School of Inspired Leadership was just being co-created with our friends from industry. And what struck me was her extreme passion for her work and also the amount of detail she would go into before planning anything. Uh, the very first joint workshop we did in, in India with uh, Laura, uh, the level of preparation, the level of going into details and the meticulousness was, was really struck me. And she has takes a tremendous amount of pride in her work. I think she genuinely cares for all significant stakeholders of the organization. And I think she appears to me at least to be at her personal best when she talks about not just the HR function that she leads in the organization, but also stewardship, where she really is interested in serving the planet to make it a better place. So Laura, what a wonderful occasion for us to host you today. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Anil, for the opportunity. Thank you. So, you know, Laura, my favorite question that I always begin these conversations with, that out of all the things you have done over the years, what is that one moment or that occasion or a period of time that stands out in your own memory when you and the team you were working with were at your personal best and which gave you a lot of happiness where everybody was really was at their best and extremely happy. What would stand out in your memory? Well, Anil, it's, uh, you know, that is a very tough question because um, I've lived a long life and I've had many happy moments. And I would say, you know, I, I would say that obviously the birth of my children were moments for me as a mother that, that were, something that I, I hold very dear to me. And the fact that I am a mother and was able to be both a leader and a mother in my life has been very important. But I think it's been actually the most moving moment for me in my work has been the last trip I made to India, actually, in March of 2020. Um, I was traveling with a team and we were in a village and we had studied this village and worked with the village to really attempt to bring uh, safe drinking water into the village. We were there to actually uh, inaugurate that gift of water and to see the impact of the lives of that community. And it was actually one woman in the community that I saw who was blind. And her job in the community every day was to bring, to go to the well and make her way by herself to the well, climb up the stairs and and bring the bucket back up again from the well and go back down the stairs and back to her home, which was across a road and into the village. And I saw that actually, Anil, and I thought that that is why we do the work. That is why we try to bring our engineers in to help a village to actually lift people up and help a woman like that. And I figured if she can do that, I can keep working through all the difficult moments in my life because she is much stronger than I am. And th that's why we do the work, Anel. It's really to continue to uh, bring our innovation, our capability to the places where we live and work to make them stronger. And tell me, how did this happen? How did this whole idea of making a difference to the particular issue on water come about? And who were the people involved? It sounds like an amazing journey that you have started. Well, I think, it, you know, in our mission and in our hearts at Kohler, water has always been central to what we do in our in innovation. If you think about, you know, we, we innovate around sanitation, we innovate around safe drinking water through faucets, we think about hygiene and bathing. So it is core to what we do. And when you start to understand the problem of safe drinking water and the lack of safe drinking water around the world, we actually wanted to marry, to bring our expertise to some of the world's greatest problems. And that's what energizes our associates. You know, when we take our capability 
and we find a need, especially where we live and work. And we focused on the communities around some of our largest manufacturing facilities. And we wanna make sure those communities are strong and vibrant and they have the essentials of what they need. And I think it was really from our associates really saying we care, we can f solve some of these problems and we wanna help. What a wonderful way of looking at it. And uh, you know, congratulations. I notice on social media that whenever you personally post something on this subject, uh, you seem to express straight from the heart and also the responses you get from so many people. Uh, they seem to be very genuinely pleased and take great amount of pride in being part of the Cola company. So, so thank you for that work. Now, you know, one thing I've uh, found that uh, organizations are really places where people discover who they are. And I just wonder what has been the role that you have played over the years with your colleagues in building a sense of community at, in the workplace in Kola. I would be particularly keen to know how you have designed that uh, sense of ownership and community in the organization. So I think that the community is so important. People want to know that they're part of something larger than themselves. Uh, it is not um, satisfying to just come to a place and have a job and go home. Uh, people actually want to be part of a greater network. They also want to have purpose. So I think it's, we created community around purpose, actually. And um, we also have, I would call micro communities as well inside of our larger Kohler community. And for us, bringing people together around a purpose and is something that um, has really proved over the last 10 years to be very much of a binding um, and motivating force for us. So we do something called run for safe water around the world. And we activate our associates and they run and, and raise money and we actually can contribute water filters to different parts of the world that need it, but it's all associate driven. So I call it the power of the people really, and it's associates in action. And I think that's the key. We have activated our associates with purpose. How nice to know that. And this purpose that people uh, identify with, uh, you know, oftentimes organizations define purpose in somewhat narrow ways. Sometimes they just talk about their customers and the business that they are in. And their purpose statement seems more like just paying a too much attention only to customers and shareholders. But in your case, you have very consciously made it more like a higher purpose. And what was the genesis of that? And how did that come about? Well, it really goes back to um, a belief that we have. It's called believing in better. Mm -hmm. And I think if you think about it, you know, we believe a, that there's a better planet is possible you know, better communities and better lives. And if you think about those three things, then we try to focus our work in those pillars. And we have a historic, I would say, um, experience around those three areas. And communities absolutely supports our people where we live and work. Better lives supports the people that work here. And then, Better Planet is actually our responsibility to actually improving the environment and not taking away from it. So that helps frame why we do what we do every day. And you know, my uh, trips to, uh, to Kohler have also shown me the tremendous amount of focus you have on the whole subject of innovation and design. <laughs> and, and so you are all the time concerned about uh, not only being focused on making the world better, you take the role of uh, studying your stakeholders in their natural habitat with great care. And uh, the focus you have on design and innovation is quite remarkable. So tell me, where does that come from? Well, you know, my great grandfather started this company. Um, and um, about 146 years ago. Wow. And he, yes, yeah, so um, innovation has always been in our DNA. And uh, he took a horse trough hog scalder and turned it into a bathtub. He put four legs on it and it became a bathtub. 
So he's always listening. He was always listening to the marketplace and adjusting, adapting, and innovating. And I would say, uh, and today, my brother David is the CEO. And um, today, we are very focused in all of our businesses on innovation. And we even have a small business unit called Innovation for Good. Mm-hmm. And that um, is an incubator of sorts of ideas and that are coming from our organization uh, that actually are, again, around believing in better. We have ideas around better planet. We have ideas around improving our communities and better lives. We incubate those ideas. And sometimes the businesses, the big businesses of Kohler will pick up those ideas and make a product. How nice. Now tell me, uh, because you are a 142 year old company, you must have heard many stories when you were a young kid about the family legacy and which were some of the stories that you heard that really influenced you and shaped you as a, as a person. You know, I think that the story that influenced me probably the most was uh, that of my grandfather, Herbert Kohler Sr. He died in 1968, and um, I only knew him for a short time of my life, Um, and he was really a man of the people, and I say that because he led through the longest strike in U.S. history, which was an eight-year strike right here in Kohler, Wisconsin, and he really fought for the, the right of the worker, the worker to make a choice, not to be forced to join a union, but to be able to make a choice, whether to be in, in, with the union or to stand apart from the union. And he fought for that right for eight years. And the other thing that he believed in in the stories that I heard was that he walked the floor of his plants. He handed out cigars to the workers, but he was really of the people. And I've always modeled myself and said, I need to walk the manufacturing floors of Kohler Company around the world. I spend my time in the field, and actually that's some of the most valuable time I have is with our associates in many parts of the world, listening, having town halls, and actually seeing our products being made in every different country that we uh, do business in. Now now I know where that comes from, so thank you. (laughs) So thank you for sharing that. And tell me, as you were growing up, there must have been a choice at some point in your own mind on whether to work for the family business or to be independent and do something else. So how was that journey? I know that you went to Duke and I know that Duke recently also honored you and so on and so forth. But uh, tell us, just walk us through your journey as to what were these stages on how you chose to come and work for the family business rather than do other things. So tell us about well, I. I would tell you, Anil, that when I left Kohler at 18 years old, I thought I would never come back. I, you know, 18 years in a, in a village named Kohler, when you're Laura Kohler and you go to Kohler high school, you know, that's kind of enough. (laughs) So, you know, I ran away to college and um, really thought that I was going to go off and maybe be a lawyer, uh, a politician, um, an actress. Uh, something like that, but I was going to go change the world. And um, I went and and did good work for 10 years outside of Kohler Company, um, undergraduate, graduate school. And uh, I think when I was about 28 years old, living in Chicago, working in Chicago, I realized at that moment that, that actually Kohler was something very special and that I didn't have to run from it anymore. And I could actually embrace the legacy, embrace the history, and that maybe I had something to give back. And um, I actually started to appreciate um, all that had come before me. And and I came in through Kohler Foundation and I became the executive director of the Arts and Education Foundation. And from there, it was just a path into Kohler Company, into the corporate world of leadership and, and I've been here 28 years. That's remarkable. That's remarkable. Now tell me, how did you get uh, to get to be involved in the human resources function? And how did you come <laughs> to this role that you do? How did that happen? Well, you know, um, in my 20s, I was the queen of part-time jobs. That's what I always say. Um, 
And uh, one of the jobs that I had in my 20s was I worked for Outward Bound. Outward Bound is an experiential education school that's a global brand. And I had the opportunity to actually become both an urban instructor and a wilderness instructor for Outward Bound. And through that work, I also facilitated corporate groups in experiential learning under the Outward Bound umbrella. So I got to work at, which is really today kind of organizational development work. It is learning and development. So I got my toe in the water in that space. Uh, when I came back to Kohler and started working as a leader in Kohler Company, I actually started to use some of my outward bound training with the teams that I was working with. The head of HR at the time uh, happened to resign and he told my father, who was the CEO, uh, when my father said, well, what am I supposed to do? I have to go and look for a new vice president outside in the marketplace. And then the exiting vice president said, well, actually, no, Mr. Cole, you don't have to do that. You have the head of HR right here. And my father said, what do you mean? Who, what are you talking about? And um, Jim Sweet, who was the exiting vice president said, well, it's Laura. And my father said, well, she's the director of public affairs or vice president of communications. What would she know about HR? And Jim Sweet is the one who said, Mr. Kohler, she knows about people. She's a leader. She's a, she has managed the global branding of this company. And uh, she's actually employing all the things that you want in a leader and in human resources. And just taking her and putting her in human resources will be the right decision. And that happened 21 years ago, oh, that's and the right. rest is history. So um, yeah, I right. was sad to give up communications, but I was, I think that the, the managing the people function of any company is, um, is actually an honor and a huge opportunity. Great. You know, what I have noticed a lot about Cola is that in the last few years, you have put a lot of emphasis on things like diversity and inclusion, you have also done a lot of work on making the workplace much more attractive in terms of your employee value proposition. And you've been doing a lot of work on culture and culture development. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit more about uh, where are all these initiatives coming from and what has enabled you to facilitate and lead these initiatives? So we're on that journey, Anil. We are on that journey to shift the culture and we're on the journey to actually um, bring more diversity to our workplace around the world and also drive inclusion. We're not finished, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Uh, and it's really something that we must do to continue to evolve as a company. You know, as you know, the, the workforce is getting younger and younger. Uh, they are changing, their expectations are changing, customers are changing. So Kohler has to continue to adapt and COVID has really uh, accelerated our ability to actually shift the culture and collaborate more. Um, it has created trust in, in when you are all remote working, you have to actually rely on technology to communicate and um, get things done. So it has accelerated our ability to actually prioritize, own, innovate, all the things that we are actually uh, trying to strengthen in the culture. What we have to continue to do is really identify areas in our company where diversity is essential, and we have to actually in allow inclusion to take hold and value all the differences that we have around the world. That's really the work in front of us right now. But you know, one of the most amazing examples of diversity in action I observed in Kola was when you picked up your head of the China business, Larry, and you brought him into North America to become this global leader at a very young age. So he was both young, he was Chinese, and you brought him to your corporate headquarters into a new role. And that must have taken a lot of, uh, I would say, conscious thinking to say, we, we go by merit, we don't go by age, we don't go by nationality. And that was something special. So how did you enable yourself and everybody to do things like that? Well, first of all, we thank Larry for coming to uh, Kohler and working out of the headquarters because 
Kohler is not as interesting and as as fun as Shanghai. So, yes. so first yes. of all, you know, um, yes. it is we do we have a number of our leaders who actually have moved here from around the world, and um, and we thank them for that. And we also try to move leaders and rotate leaders and also junior managers to other countries. So we do try to to globally develop. Um, I think really it is about the talents that we are developing and can attract to Kohler. It isn't about uh, where in the world somebody comes from. It is about the best talent and it's about the insights that they bring and their sensitivity to delighting the customer, their focus on innovation. And it is really, how do we collect people that are diverse and actually can bring uh, and make the fabric of Kohler companies stronger? I also noticed that you are uh, you have a very conscious process on talent management where you identify talent at a young age and you begin to groom them. And one of the examples is one of our alums, uh, Shubika, from our charter batch, whom you picked up and groomed her and rotated her into different assignments. And right now she's in Europe. And then there was another one of our alums called Mohit Tripathi who worked with Kohler and then he went on to L'Oreal and had a senior role there. And now he's into another company looking after e-commerce. So you had something about the way you set this up, where you identified talent at a young age, and you had a very conscious process of grooming your talent. Uh, could you share a little bit more about that? Well, talent management, talent development is always a work in process. So I will say we're never quite done. We're always improving. We are working on a culture model and a leader model right now that will inform and update all of our leader programs around the world. But identifying talent early in career is important because if we can do that, we can rotate them so much more easily to stretch assignments. Uh, actually, young talent is much more mobile, right, than some of the us who have families and schooling and all of that. And um, so we really do try multiple assignments because we believe that whether you're a functional leader or a general manager, if you have multiple assignments, you have much more, I would say, experience set foundation to draw upon. So if we can, we like to do that. And we also believe sometimes the hard and lonely assignments are the best. And uh, so putting a really talented young person in a tough assignment is... Um, is difficult, but they learn a lot. So we, we try to identify our talent in, um, as young as possible in the company, as early as possible. Yeah, you know, I completely buy that because when I was a young uh, management trainee with the Tatas, when I started my career, my first boss, a wonderful man called V.S. Mahesh, who's no more now, he, he this is what he said to me. He said, give somebody 14 hours work to do in eight hours and Believe in that person, that the person can do a level which is two levels above where the person is. And, you know, that's the best way of developing people. So he, he told me as a young trainee, imagine that you're doing my job. And how would you sort of conduct yourself now? Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, kind of confidence, so exactly what you said, when you give them into tough assignments and make them and have faith in them and show that they are capable of doing it, uh, many things would happen. That's, that's, that's a wonderful thing to hear. I want to, I, uh, yeah, go ahead, Laura, please go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I wanted to actually tell you about two other things that are happening. Because of COVID, we've actually started to be much more agile and put together sprint teams to identify a, a problem and solve it in like a six week period of time. That's a great opportunity for young talent to get involved. The yes. other opportunity that we are finding is um, business resource groups. And young talent is very interested in forming business resource groups and they can self-organize, activate, and they can help us solve problems. So in this world where we're not traveling right now, these sprint teams and business resource groups become ever more important in addition to the jobs that they're doing in the company. And then the purpose work, the young talent that we have that is um, really energized, really wants to be involved in purpose work. So I think it's all of those things if you want to actually have your young talent thrive with you as a brand. Yes. You know, I've been very fortunate uh, that since a number of your uh, executives and uh, leaders come to our global leadership program, over the years I've had the opportunity to coach many of them. 
And here is what I have experienced in the Kola leaders. Very intense, very passionate. And they really want to take responsibility. And, you know, they are very intense leaders. So when this COVID crisis began to sort of unfold, how did this intensity and this passion express itself? And how did it get that channeled into things that you have been doing? That's a great question, Anil. Uh, we, we came together like I've never seen before. Uh, and it started that middle, middle point of March. And we stayed together for eight weeks. And I would say I've never seen our businesses and our corporate teams collaborate. We created incident response teams. We had a commercial incident response team that focused on getting product to customer regardless of product. So we had people from around the world on daily phone calls um, joining together to figure out how we could make sure that the customer's needs were met. We had um, an associate care response team making sure that the technology was working so people could work remotely seamlessly and their jobs weren't interrupted. We had the safety protocol and procedure response team. We had manufacturing and business continuity response team. And all of these teams, Anil, weren't just in one business. They were cross-pollinated with different businesses and the corporate staff and different levels. We had managers and vice presidents all working together. And the best person, it wasn't the highest level person running each team. It was the best person suited to run the team. Wow. So That's it was very remarkable. powerful. Yeah. yeah. And it really taught us when we have a mountain to climb, when we know what that shared goal is, we can do it. And yeah. we can come together and get rid of all of our differences. And um and I just think that's a huge learning from the COVID situation that we will take into the future. Very nice. And Laura, just before our webinar started and I was chatting with you, you were also telling me how there is this agility has been demonstrated in things like one of your factory making ventilators and PPEs and so on. Could you talk more about that? So when COVID began, one of the things that we realized is that we have a sourcing capability we could source um, protective equipment for the medical community. So we activated our procurement function to go out and help source um, all of the medical gear that is needed in the hospitals. And we were able to do that in China and in the US and we donated over 99,000 uh, pieces of, of PPE to um, the medical community. And then in addition to that, we figured out how to make face shields and we make face shields now in China and we make it also in the US and we're able to dis distribute 260,000 face shields um, into again, the medical community. And then the other thing that we did was our Myra manufacturing facility in the UK in Cheltenham figured out how to assemble ventilators. So wow. those ventilators are being made for the hospitals in the UK. So you know, the, the agility of our teams, the passion, the unending energy, Anil, that it took to drive through the work of the last couple of months and figure things out on a daily basis, sometimes hourly basis of, of problems we've never seen before, really impressive. That's really, that's really wonderful. Now, before I open up the conversation, to, there are lots of questions that are already bubbling up. Uh, amongst our participants here. I want to ask you one question that uh, what is it that you have discovered about your, yourself which is special and unique and how are you leveraging your own gifts to serve the planet? Well, Anil, I, I think that my gifts are You know, I think I have a gift for communication and for inspiring people and to figuring out what's possible. And I guess I try to bring people with me uh, along that journey. And so that my gifts are not in an office. I'm not my best when I'm by myself studying reports. I'm actually at my best when I'm out listening hearing what the issues are, and then bringing resources together to actually help solve a problem. 
And, right. um, and I feel like that's my calling. And as much as I can get to do that work, uh, that's what fills me up. And I think that's where I can make an impact. Very nice. A lot of there are always uh, points in one's journey as a leader where we where things don't turn out to be quite the way we expected them to, and so the, all of us experience downside, you know, and difficulties and so-called failures. Would you like to talk about anything that you have experienced in your life that has been a rich source of learning for for you and what you gained out of that uh, difficulty or whatever you, you would like to call that? So, you know, um, I think that uh, sometimes I regret I don't have an MBA. I have an MFA, a Master's of Fine Arts, and that makes me very different in the corporate world. And because I was always a working mother, I never, I never went back and got an MBA. So there are times when I feel like I failed. I'm not as good as some of the others in my, of my colleagues. Uh, but I have to per persevere and I realize I can never be perfect, right? There is no such thing as a perfect executive, a perfect leader. And I feel like as long as I can continue to be open to learning, Anil, as, as, and I can learn from my failures, if I can learn from my setbacks, I need to continue to do that. So talking about my setbacks talking about things that didn't go well and how I'm learning from them actually helps other people. And so I actually get pretty good at admitting when I didn't do something well, because um, it actually is time for me to reflect on it, but it also helps others say that it's okay not to be perfect all the time. And um, yeah, I, I guess I, one of the things that I try to overcome is fear fear of doing something that I feel is right, but, but having, but being worried about whether how it will be perceived. So, you know, continuing to build confidence and my judgment and uh, how I move through the world with change um, and try to do it without fear. Very nice. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for that very authentic sharing. Now, Monica Tata, who is based in Portugal, uh, she's asking a question. Is it possible to ask what is Kohler planning about systematic transformation at their end in relation to redefining wastewater management? Uh, hmm. And, you know, and do things like that. Is, this, is, there any, is that an area of focus in Kohler? Well, right now we're not involved in wastewater management. That's not one of our businesses, but we are focused on clean water or fresh water or safe water uh, focus on how do we bring that technology into communities, into homes, into residences, and really how do we continue to make toileting as efficient and as safe as possible. Wonderful. Laura, one of our young students, uh, young uh, female student, Sneha Yadav, she's asking a question. She said, Laura, you have been actively involved in theater, arts, and education. And how do these activities impact your life as a professional? What do you source out of this to enable you to be the leader that you are? Well, actually, it goes what I just said. I have a master's of fine arts. Um, well, first of all, I'm very comfortable speaking in front of people, which, and I'm very comfortable meeting people. I'm very comfortable having conversations. And that goes to my theater background, actually. Uh, and so that has been very helpful. I think Exposure to the arts and a love of the arts actually works really well at Kohler Company too, because my appreciation for the designers, for the creative process, being able to help source the talent for some of the um, areas that we, and then, then also encourage things like arts industry at Kohler. I'm responsible for arts industry. So allowing arts to thrive within a company and um, is something that I'm really pleased with. So I have brought my past into Kohler and, um, and Kohler has also allowed me to continue to do that work. And it, Kohler is a place where that is, has been our tradition. Very nice. Uh, Dr. Virender Sangwan, who is a well-known eye doctor, eye specialist, uh, so an ophthalmologist, 
he is asking a particular question. He's saying, what is that one thing of customer delight that we can apply in our hospitals? He's a senior doctor. And, you know, is there any insight to have on customer delight, which would be transferred into the healthcare industry uh, from, from your experience? You know, I would go back to this word called empathy and really that understanding where someone is in their life at the moment you're meeting them, right? Whether that's a hospital, whether that we're in a building project, um, because if you can bring empathy and walk in their shoes, you can actually serve that customer more effectively. And um, whether it's empathy for in our hotel business with our guests on the golf course, whether it's a plumbing customer, I think empathy is actually a key component to customer delight. Very nice. Uh, Sudhir Banerjee, who's a former colleague of mine from my Aisha days and worked with Honeywell and now with ABB into a senior leadership position, he is trying to understand, do you use that typical nine block performance assessment model for talent management? And if so, uh, how does that, uh, you know, how useful has that been in your talent management process? I love the nine block process and we do use it, yes. Um, and I would actually like to have it even more actively utilized. I, I believe that it actually helps a manager think about their talent when they can plot their talent. Um, every company may have a slightly different spin on it, but it does help you as a leader think about the performance and potential of your team? And then how do you develop each one of those members to move them uh, in, in different spaces on the nine block? So I like it and um, I think it's a very useful tool. Wonderful. Another former colleague of mine, uh, a woman leader, uh, Mridula Dang, who works with one of the top law firms here as, into a senior role. Uh, she is asking a question that India has this huge initiative on sanitation with under Prime Minister Modi, you know, this whole, what is called clean the country, literally. And therefore providing toilets to people and then making them more aware of cleanliness and so on. Uh, to what extent does Kohler identify with that mission of this country? And to what extent are you also inspired to make a difference in this country to improving its sanitation and health standards? Well, first of all, we're so pleased that Prime Minister Modi is making it uh, one of his priorities. And he did so very early in his leadership. Okay. And that actually helps a company like Kohler where sanitation and access to clean water is um, one of our priorities. So we actually believe that um, our work in India goes hand in hand with what the Prime Minister is doing. So it's very helpful. Thank you. One of our uh, soil students is asking the question, now the world is talking about transformation to digital. So what is COLA planning on in terms of the digital front and on also how HR function is enabling digital transformation? So it's very interesting. We were on a digital transformation path like many companies and then the COVID situation actually changed our world because it forced everyone to work remotely and it exposed areas of opportunity that we have. So we're right now experimenting. Um, you know, we are now a big Microsoft Teams company. We had kind of mediocre adoption right before COVID. And we are now in the top 10% of companies in terms of Microsoft Teams adoption. And um, Satya Nadella even commented about Kohler in one of his um, monthly uh, stockholder calls. We're pretty proud of that. Um, and then we're, we're experimenting with other technologies like Humu, which is a nudge type of technology that helps you um, nudge people towards the culture or the productivity levels that you want. Um, so it's, it's pretty exciting actually, because now we are so much more open to um, different ideas on how to handle remote work and how the benefit of technology can really push us forward. One of the young leaders in this group, uh, Shrey Jain, is asking a question. How do I discover my real passion and interest and calling in something so that I become a better version of myself? Because I'm at a young age and I'm still trying to find out 
uh, what is my real calling and interest or passion and how does one is there any guidance that you can provide for this young leader to discover herself or himself better well first of all i really believe that if if you can find the nexus between your passion and your talents and that becomes your life work that is a very powerful thing to have discovered so in your 20s i really believe experimentation trying different things, getting involved with different organizations, whether that's through volunteer, volunteerism, whether that is through just your networks. Um, now is the time to try different things and you will find how you feel when you are with different types of organizations doing different types of work. And there is a difference. You will feel very fulfilled when you actually find your passion. You will find that the world opens up around you and um, you can really come to life and make things happen when you're in your sweet spot of passion and talent. Wonderful. I think the Japanese have an interesting word for that. They call it ikigai, which is a very interesting uh, concept where your passion and what your gifts are and what the world requires and what the world is willing to pay for when they all come together. So I think you are guiding us to a similar concept of ikigai. Mm -hmm. Ikigai. Okay, I'll ikigai. remember that. Yes. Uh, Ashish Yadav, who is one of the soil alums, uh, he uh, did our master's in marketing and in our MBA program. And he's just recently joined Kohler as a India procurement manager at the corporate procurement uh, Gurgaon. And so he is uh, very moved to appreciate the impact you have on the company. He says that, uh, you know, you have been driving wellness programs in Kohler and very few other companies do that. And, you know, he's comparatively new in Kohler, but he's particularly struck by how you personally are encouraging that. And that has developed much greater confidence in him and many other people. So tell me, where is that coming from? He felt, feels, of course, a lot of pride in, in, in having joined Kohler. So I think, Anil, we're, we are expanding this concept of well-being at Kohler to incorporate a number of things. And, um, and first of all, thank you. Thank the caller for, for working at Kohler and for being part of that India team. So we believe that well-being is an integration of the elements that help us thrive. And I tended, I actually tend to think what has helped me thrive as a mother, as a leader, as a community member? And what is it that makes me feel like I can do the work every day? I can go home and be a, a, a mother as well and a wife. And I think about the things, it's my emotional health, it's my mental health, it's my physical health, it's my spiritual health, but it's also the environment of inclusion that I work in. It is um, my purpose, how much I can give back and do I feel linked to something and the greater good. It's things like um, belonging. Do I feel as if I belong in my community? Do I feel like I belong to a group at work? It is, do I feel safe, right? Do I have a sense of safety? You know, do I have an opportunity to grow and learn? So it's so many different things. And I think at Kohler, what we're trying to do is actually create that space where we have opportunities that you can actually enhance your well-being when you're working for us. And you can actually go home uh, at the end of the day or re-engage with your family and friends. And you can actually feel as if you were nourished, you were strengthened by actually working um, in this environment. Very nice. You know, I've always believed that if workplaces were to become truly uh, places of uh, where people really felt inspired, they would return to their communities and to their homes. At the end of the day, energize and they would then yeah. spread that in the entire community rather than you know feel that oh why why did i go to work so in this case you become thank god it's a monday company rather than thank god it's a friday company yes right? exactly exactly <laughs> yes, absolutely very nice to know that uh, there's a question from shubran shurout who's asking that now that the home is my citadel where mm -hmm. home is now the restaurant, the classroom, the playground, the movie theater, the temple, the pub. How is Cola gearing up to cater to this new normal? Is the company <laughs> doing some innovation in this in your products and services? For this, this this gentleman works with the Airtel company, the big telecom company of India. Yeah. 
Yes, well, you know, so yes, your home is your citadel. That's wonderful. And uh, certainly good for our business. But we are, so we are seeing some spikes in some of our products, our touchless products, right? Our bidet seat product, things like that, that are very hygiene focused or, um, and, and I think you're going to see more technology around touchless coming through in, in many of our products and in our buildings, um, in our communities. And I think that we are making sure that our manufacturing facilities are moving at the speed that the, the world is going to move when they're looking at their homes and enhancing their homes. So yes, we're preparing for this and we are already seeing um, increased focus in improving the nest, let's say, of where you live. Very nice. Uh, Laura, one of our co-founders of Soil and an entrepreneur who set up a high-tech company, his name is Yogesh Andley, a board member of our company. Yogesh is asking a question that family-owned enterprises in India can learn a lot from Kohler. And what thoughts would you like to share about how they can transform family-owned enterprises into a professional multinational enterprise? You know, so this is a very thoughtful question because many family-owned businesses do not become global companies, but you have managed to do that. So what would be some of the insights you would like to share? So I think for us, you know, the family has always been an important part of our company and, um, and our story and our history. But honestly, it is really about the talent that we have had through the generations that have helped shape this company, the, the key talent we've attracted to the company and put in key roles. And, you know, there are very few Kohlers actually that work for Kohler. Um, mind you, we're in significant roles, but it is really about amplifying the impact of the others right, of, of allowing other people to have voice, to have strategy, to lead, to highlight other leaders at the company and make sure we have 38,000 people that work for Kohler around the world. There are only four Kohlers that work for Kohler Company. So it is really about the talent that you bring in and that you allow to thrive and to shape the future of the company. Wonderful. Uh, one of our colleagues, uh, my, uh, you know, my colleague, uh, Arjia, she is the chair of our human resource leadership program. So she is asking, what are the essentials of the innovation culture at Kohler? Could you describe that a bit more? So first of all, we support innovation, research and development, regardless of economic um, changes in cycle. So I think that's one of the the core pillars of Kohler. We are focused on innovation always, and it is funded always. We are also always looking to have great talent and engage that talent, and then really create an environment of diversity and uh, inspiration. So I think it's multiple things. And um, we also challenge our innovation teams around the world. So it is not just incremental innovation, it is always um, the challenge that we put in front of them. And again, listening and delighting the customer. So I think it's a lot of different things, Anil, and, um, and we've been at this a long time, so we are always open to change, but there are some things that, like that I just said that are, are core to how we do it. Wonderful. Uh, Dean Dialan, uh, who is also an adjunct faculty in our school, and you know he works at the grassroots level with the blue collar uh, workers. He has a hundred consultants who work with him in all the major factories in India. And he was he's talking about the impact of uh, IoT, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and he, he's wondering would the middle management as a role become redundant? Uh, given the impact of technology, or do you think that uh, that is not quite the situation? Well, I, I don't know about that. I know that technology will continue to change the way we work, whether you're in the manufacturing environment, whether you're in the office environment. Yes. Um, it will connect people uh, differently than, you know, even we can see that in the last eight weeks. Um, yes. You know, with virtually no travel, mm -hmm. right, we have been able to stay connected. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure it changes management layers as much as it changes how we work, where we work, and what we work on and the speed. Mm -hmm. So that, that may change the organizational structure 
um, and, and again, how and where we work. So uh, also, I think manufacturing will continue to evolve as well as technologies continue to be brought into manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, Kanchan, uh, you know, who worked with Kohler in, in HR, you may remember Kanchan. She was there yep. as a part of your HR team. She's in, in a part of the webinar and she says, I have a deep sense of gratitude to have had the opportunity to work with Kohler. And she says, you are an inspiration as a working mother and professional. And I always wondered how you do it all. Uh, please, <laughs> please share some advice to be better today. Well, I get to ask this question all the time, Anil. Yes. Um, I think that, first of all, um, I do make time for sleep and I make time for exercise. And for me, that is really key to my ability. And I also, as a person, I do have high energy in general. But sleeping, you know, seven to eight hours a night is really important for me. Um, and then my time in the morning, uh, I learned actually how to meditate with you, Anil, on a retreat with you. Um, so meditation is part of my morning ritual as well as exercise. And I would just say that there are things that I don't do. And um, I don't have enough time for a lot of friends. And um, so that is something that I, it's a deficit I have in my life, but I, um, but I raised three girls and I also don't read enough books. And so I hope in this next chapter of my life that I actually nurture my friendships a little bit more. I have a little more time as my girls are in their 20, going into their 20s. And I hope that I actually can read some more books because I have them stacked on my nightstand. Wonderful. Uh, Shivani Bhatnagar, this uh, young uh, female, uh, you know, student in this in soil, she says, how are you enhancing diversity and inclusion virtually, which is usually a challenge even in a physical world? So how do we nurture inclusion virtually? Yes. Right. That's the question. Yes. Now? yes. Yes. You know, I think that is the challenge that's in front of us now in this new world of this remote work environment. And I think it goes back to listening. I think it goes back to making sure that when you are on a group call that you ask everyone to participate, that, that, that you ask for opinions, that every, put, everybody's opinion counts, right? And, um, and that people are heard. That is really important. And leaders have to be very intentional about that. Uh, because you can actually miss somebody in this very virtual environment, and then they won't feel as if they're part of the team. So doing some extra things to reach out intentionally to your team members is um, is really important. Uh, Niveda, who is also a young woman uh, studying in the postgraduate program in soil, she says, it's wonderful to hear about your conversation on diversity and inclusion, but what were the challenges you faced in global HR in bringing people together and handling conflict? Because in some cultures, in some parts of the world, uh, the diversity may not come naturally. And so how do you sort of, what were the conflicts you encountered and how did you have dialogue across differences? In, 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 so it's time. not over. This journey of diversity and inclusion is not over, and it is different in every culture, right? Yes. There are different norms. Um, there are different, you know, representation means something different in every culture. Yes. I think what we try to do, though, is have um, difference represented, meaning um, a room of people should not all look the same and be of the same background. So if we can continue to bring in people from different perspectives onto our business teams and we listen and we allow their voices and ideas to come forward, I think that's really important. Um, so when I go and facilitate a meeting, I do ask everyone in the room to participate. There are no observers. We, we all are in the meeting and we all participate. And I think um, encouraging voice, encouraging um, acknowledgement. And uh, I think that's where we hopefully then um, will be able to deal with conflict when we're listening and trying to understand. Wonderful. Rahul Jam, who heads one of the significant businesses of Aditya Birla Group, and incidentally, the member of also the Global Leadership Program, the GLP. So he's asking a question. 
it says, hi, Laura, with recent acquisition of Clark Energy, there seems to be a larger strategic interest in Kohler in engine than generator business. So how do you think the engine business and engine-based power plant business will change in the future from a sustainability perspective? Well, so so the, the power group has been with Kohler since the 1920s. Yeah. And Clark is one of our most recent acquisitions and we're, it's a British, uh, UK-based company. Um, we're really pleased with the Clark team and um, their leadership. And, you know, we hope to have um, a renewable strategy that is going to be revealed in the next couple of years. Clark could be pivotal to that. Uh, but, you know, re renewable energy is important to Kohler. It is, um, and we are suited to innovate around that. Um, so backup power also very important to communities, very important to airports, hospitals, big installations like that. Um, so, so I think this, the power group is a strategic business for us and it's a space that we want to continue to innovate around and to continue to find renewable solutions. Very nice. Adi Sharma, another one of the colleagues says, how can we prioritize our goals on a daily basis and stay happy and keep on inspiring people in the corporate world? Because especially in this, uh, because of the pandemic where things are falling apart. So how can we continue to source that positive energy? What would you, what would your insight be? So I would say as a leader, this is sometimes the hard part. You know, it's managing in the moment and helping your team get through the current crisis, the current difficulty, but always have your eye on the future, that horizon. And I think if you think about it, the people that work for you want to work for a company where there is hope, where there is a future. They don't necessarily just want to be head down managing the crisis. They always want to know that there is something better coming. So I think it's important as a leader to yes, um, have your eye in the moment, your energy in the moment, but make sure you're making time to, to actually communicate the path forward and try to anticipate and help them see the future. Wonderful. One last question, Laura, and then I'd like to sum it up because we're running out of time here. Sadil Bhandari, who runs his own uh, consulting and accounting firm, and uh, you know he talks about Kohler in India is in the upper end of the segment. Do you have any plans to reach to the masses at the at the lower end of the segment? So I would say right now we're continuing to. There's India is a large complex country, and we are continuing to focus on that upper segment and to get really good at the innovation in that space. Uh, we have a very strong India team and a strong brand, and we want to be excellent. Um, in terms of what we're delivering to the customer and how we're delighting the customer in India in that segment. Thank you. Uh, Laura, it's been a very, very, very wonderful to listen to you, to learn from you today. And I just want to sum up a few things that I have learned from you today. <laughs> One, the story of your grandfather walking on the shop floor will always remain with me. And now I know why you like to be in the middle of the action, why you want to just go to the floor, why you want to be with the people. You want to smell the place. Mm -hmm. And when you smell the place, you are completely in touch with the pulse of the organization. Mm -hmm. And and so I think that's a, that's a wonderful gift that you bring to your work. The second aspect that you talked about is that the passion that you have in your work that you almost cannot just wait to go to work. And you consciously chose three priorities. You said your family is important. Your own health is important. And being with people and doing your best for the people is important. And you really have done an amazing job of uh, bringing these three roles together. So I learned that from you today. I also learned from you that a background in liberal arts and fine arts, which in your case also took you to theater, gives you the poise and the self-confidence to be able to relate to a cross-section of people. And that is such a gift to have because you can connect to people across the world, different cultures, different things. And I think that's why in our school, we have this intense focus on learning through theater. 
you know, we encourage our students to learn a lot to source their inner confidence through theater and to explore their dilemmas in their own lives. And I can go on about other things, but just the last thing that thank you for your authenticity, thank you for your energy, and thank you for being such a passionate leader that is always bringing your best version to yourself. And so thanks, Laura, for being with us today and uh, for encouraging all the young leaders and, and the other senior leaders in this group today. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for the opportunity, Anil. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much.